Mike from Mobile Home Madness. We're uh, representing the South Atlanta area. Got a guest speaker. Uh, yeah, there you go. What's up, girl? Got, got Jose here. He's going to talk a little bit about wholesaling and, uh, and extra strategies, and he's here to answer any questions you got. Um, we got Ed over here from Rent Ready. He's uh, hosting this event for us, so we get on here since we had problems last time. He's going to you know, tell us a little bit about his service. So if you got any questions, just uh, feel free to ask in the Q&A section. Uh, the chat section is just for chatting back and forth between other attendees. All right, Ed, go ahead. All right, I'll jump in. I'll just share the screen for one second. So um, basically, Rent Ready, we, I know you guys are talking more wholesaling today, but we are a, uh, basically a platform for uh, landlords, tenants, um, let me, let me I'll jump in here and give you the, show you the website here. Uh, basically we are, um, you know, we're, we're software for handling listings, um, uh, pay, rent payments, um, maintenance requests. Uh, so tenants, if you see here, tenants can pay with their bank account, credit card, ACH, uh, debit card. Um, we use a 10 question pre-qualification that you write from your phone can just hit accept or reject after they answer those questions. You can also set up auto screening. So they answer four identity questions as part of the application and they pay $35 and you get full TransUnion credit, criminal and eviction. Um, we do a little bit unusual. We do a maintenance request from the tenants with a five second video. So the tenants write from their phone, tell you what the problem is, hit a camera, it starts taking a five second video. Um, so you can really determine, you know, whether this thing is a leaky faucet or water on the kitchen floor. And then we list out to Zillow, truly a hot pads and we're adding realtor.com and doorsteps this week. So, um, basically, um, try to handle everything except the accounting side for you. Pricing, very inexpensive. So we're just a flat price, uh, unlimited units. 80% of our landlords pay annual at $9 a month. So it's just 132 or $108 a year. That's it for us. Um, so if you're interested, you know, please happy to take a, you know, have you take a look. We're unlimited support. Um, and you just go to rentready.com, click get started. You can come into a demo version, play around all you want before making a decision as well. And, uh, I will, uh, give it back over to you guys. Let's see. And I apologize. Sorry. I'm trying to give it back to you. Yeah. Stop sharing. So it's all yours, Jose. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, You're welcome. Good on that, by the way, uh, I'm gonna check that out a little more after, after this call there. So it looks like a good Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know who's all on here, but for those of y'all who do not know me, my name is Jose Garcia. I go by the letter J, and um, I own Mobile Home Partners. So. Uh, Company, it's uh, basically a one stop shop to mobile homes and anything you need with them, whether it needs uh, moving, whether you need it to finance. We finance a lot for a lot of our, of our buyers. Uh, we do rehab inside of mobile home parks, outside, we buy with land, etc. Basically, again, is a one stop shop. And uh, we have started our education as well. So, taking on upcoming uh, new investors or new people just wanting to learn the steps of mobile homes, we do offer that as well. But, uh, that's a little bit about me. Is been doing it for about four and a half years, to be exact, four and a half years. So, so that's kind of what what I'm doing now. My focus is to own a mobile home park, and hopefully by the end of this year that that works out. But uh, right now I'm doing a lot of wholesaling. Uh, obviously, mobile home parks are a bit more expensive, uh, as we all know. But uh, that is my goal. So that's where wholesaling is coming in a lot more now than than. Couple years ago, where I was focusing a little bit more on my assets and uh, steady income, if you will. But and that's uh, what I like to talk to you about is wholesale and exit strategies within mobile homes. So just to jump in, there is with any, and this can involve real estate, but, uh, mobile homes. It doesn't matter. Is any investment you buy, you have to have an exit strategy from the get go. Uh, I mean, from the second you walking in, I can I can visit a mobile home park. And whether it's the manager, seller, whatever, they're showing me the, the mobile home. Immediately in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, what, what does this look like? Does this look like a full-time rental? Is this something I'm going to keep for 10 years, 20 years, whatever? 
or does it look like something maybe I'll compare? I can probably put a few, a few things to it, a few grand, if you will. Um, fix it, flip it, sell it. Maybe I want to finance it. I don't know, but that should be triggering in your mind immediately. When you're seeing any property for the first time, you need to have that already in mind. You need to learn how to how to run comps. Unlike real estate, we don't have Zillow, Truly, or Realtor, et cetera. We don't have none of that. So we have to do a lot of the legwork ourselves to figure out what is the comps in a certain area, what is the rental rates, right? So you need to know all these things so that, again, it helps with exit strategy, okay? Um, quick example of that, you know, and this was learning curve for me, but uh, I'll go ahead and mention the city, Columbus, Georgia. So found great deals there, came in, and I did no research. I thought, oh my gosh, these things smokers are cheap. So I'll buy me four to be exact. And of course, I go in there, get my handyman, my contract, get the rehabbing. And again, no research on the market itself. I'm just thinking I made it somewhere. <laughs> so I put these things at, I think it was around 700. And for, for those of y'all who don't know where Columbus, Georgia is, south of Georgia, but the rental rates there are very low. I think it was around, this time around 500. Yet the lot rents were right around 400, 450. So you can imagine the spread. You're me trying to come in and do 700. What I'm getting at is do your homework. You have to know numbers to make sense. And exit strategies, what you need to keep in mind. Um, I'll answer questions on that in a bit, but let me jump on to wholesale. Wholesale is, I like to think, unless you have very deep pockets, very financially well, getting started, I think most most of us start with wholesale. I, I did, definitely, uh, and, and I'm doing it a lot now. You never really leave wholesale behind. You know, a, a lot of investors, when I speak to them, um, they, they have this thing for wholesale like it's uh, like it's negative thing, um, like they look down upon. But the way I see it is, the more business you do, the more deals that come to you, you're always going to have wholesale. There may be a property that hits your desk and it's a great deal. I just don't like it. You, you don't have to have a reason as to why you're not. But if you're networking out there, you know that there is an investor who may love it. So all you have to do is connect it and make some money off of it. You never turn a good deal away. So wholesale stays with you forever. I like to think of that way. Um, and I have many deals that way that come to my desk and it's just may, may just be a city, county, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's just not something I want to focus on at that time. So immediately I'll start calling my investors and seeing who may take interest in it and I'll make some money off of that. They win, the seller wins, everybody wins. Okay. But wholesaling is something you start because, well, I guess with mobile homes, you're really not selling real estate anyway, you're selling private property. But with wholesaling, you're basically playing the middleman. That's all you do. You're connecting a buyer with a seller. Nothing more. You're selling paper, right? You're selling the connection. So the way I structure mine, and I would suggest anybody, is obviously find something that is lower than market value, enough that you can still wholesale it for, for what is lower than market value, right? So you want to find great deals that you can still give a good deal to a buyer, investor, whoever may want that home. And again, you simply connect. You simply connecting, and you're making money off of that. That will enhance, obviously, grow your pocket. And later on, if it is something that you look for more short-term or long-term rentals or whatever it is that you want to do, with flipping, you, you know, now you have your money. Um, I don't want to go too deep into it. There is such thing as private money lenders, hard money lenders. Those come into mind as well, of course. But keep it keep it simple, and basically to create your own pocket. Wholesaling is the way to go. Any questions on that so far? Hey, yeah, Jose, can you slide up just a little bit or, you know, get your mic a little closer? For some reason, your audio keeps kind of going in and out. Let me get the earpiece. Is that better? Uh, it's good right now. Uh, just okay. let everybody know if you want to ask any questions, uh, ask in the Q&A down there at the bottom. If you want to chat between, between attendees, use the chat button. Um, yeah, well, this is the first time me hosting something like this, so uh, we're not familiar with the sound quality or how that's going to turn out. We're, tr we're trying our best, but if uh, we continue to have problems, we'll just try to get him to readjust it again. But feel free to answer any questions or ask any questions in the Q&A. Okay. I'm going to give it a minute before I go on. Uh, no, go ahead. Nobody's saying nothing just yet. Okay. Uh, 
one way, you know, this is a question that I get a lot and I see it a lot on the social media is uh, there's no good deals. There's no such thing. There's good deals everywhere. You just need to find them. You need to know where to look. You need to know where to, where to network, where to structure your marketing. Marketing is huge. In case y'all follow me, you'll see that I'll post every day religiously. That's I used to do morning and evenings until Facebook put me in Facebook jail. So <laughs> I had to cut back a little bit. But you have to let people know that you're there. You're there. You're there to buy their home. You're there to sell. When they think of a mobile home need, they need to think of you, right? But I do want to answer. I'm going to go ahead and answer to that is where do you find a good deal? I find the best deals, obviously, off market. Same as with real estate. You know, the ones that are already posted, that are already listed, these people most likely already tried to sell, and it did not. So it ended up on the market. That's not always the case. But if it's on the market, one, if it's a great deal, it's not going to last. You, you're fighting 20, 30 people to try to get it. I like to do the good old-fashioned go to mobile home parks and knock on a few doors. If you go into any mobile home park and you see anybody out there walking, a resident, stop them for a minute and just simply as much as ask, uh, that what I would say is, uh, hey, I'm looking to buy a mobile home in this area. Do you know anybody selling? Be friendly, be professional, and I assure you, Anybody in that park can tell you everything is going on. <laughs> Michael here can definitely relate. He manages parks, so he knows. <laughs> but it's as simple as that. And I assure you, depending on the size of the park, somebody's always either selling, thinking of selling, or about to sell. And that's all you have to do is connect, connect, and obviously follow up. Every other week, maybe swing by, knock on a few more doors, and get your business cards, leave them out there. And again, let people know you're there. You're interested. Those off-market deals are always going to be the best deals to go. Um, visiting the mobile home park uh, manager, because you're going to have to work with them. If you're trying to work inside this mobile home park, wherever it is, you will deal with the park manager sooner or later. So better sooner than later. Go ahead and introduce yourself to them. Let them know. Understand there's some parts that, regardless of what you're offering, they don't want you there. Unless you're a tenant yourself, subleasing is out of the question. So you have to, in sense, find, find those that do allow you. And again, network. You, you know, some of the parks that I've, uh, I've started with uh, didn't care to see me or stand me or any, any of the above. Just simply leave kind of thing. But kept following up, kept being professional, and eventually a deal came. And I mean, some of these parks, the, the least that wanted me there, now call me. Hey, we might have a mobile home coming up available. Are you, are you interested? I'm always interested, so sure. But that's how you build your your relationship with them. Always be transparent, be honest, and the best deals are always going to come from, from off market and from management. And by best deals, I mean I've got many, many free mobile homes just for simply networking correctly. That's that's great advice, you know, stopping and talking to the the residents, you know, I've, that's nothing personally I've done. I've, you know, asked them about lot rent and stuff like that, but never asked them, you know, if somebody's got a home for sale. So yeah, that's definitely great advice. You know, problem I have, even, even being a manager of parks, man, the, the, these homes sell inside my parks before I even find out about them. They'll, they'll already be sold to a family member or something. So, uh, of course, you know, they're not going to tell the manager anything until they have to. So you drive around and, uh, you know, just ask around. You definitely might, you know, get some good leads that way. Yeah, they might not see you as friendly, unfortunately. And <laughs> you're the manager, so you're in charge. But well, we we gonna stay away from that guy. <laughs> but, but but yeah, I mean, and again, that's that's my strategy. That's what I use. I mean, there's plenty of ways to advertise. I still use banda signs, uh, social media. You'll hear me say a lot of that. And, and uh, social media is free. I mean, you would be out of your mind not to use it if you're trying to be known in any way, right? So my marketing, my ads. I mean, I have probably 300 pages I follow on Facebook market every city every county where I want to do business before I even attempt to I'm gonna go ahead and add some of these pages and kind of get a feel for the community um, that's that's another way to how you you find obviously what the rental rates are you know if it's worth worth your while obviously investing in these areas um, like I mentioned nothing against Columbus Georgia but it's definitely not a place where you want to create rentals not inside of mobile home parks rental rates in that area are obviously very low it would make for a good flip. You could definitely come in. You could start wholesale. That, that would work there. But uh, you definitely not an investment in that sense. Then I had to learn that one the hard way. So took took my losses and never looked back. 
So, Michael, I can't tell if anybody's listening. Yeah. Or... I haven't seen anybody ask, ask any questions yet. Nobody's got any questions on this content here? Let me see. I think somebody's asking something in the chat section. Oh, you got a question about, you know, just investing in parks. Uh, you know, somebody wants to know about investing in just uh, homes outside of parks on private land, private property. Real, real property, you know, homes attached to land. Let me see. Uh, hey, gents, most of it, most if not all of what I have been hearing is in reference to investing in parks. How about marketing to those owners outside of parks? Okay, great question. And yes, I love land packages. Land packages is a mobile home with a piece of land. Those are a beautiful thing, beautiful inventions for sure. They sell very much like real estate, even almost as much as real estate prices, which is crazy to me. But I advertise the same way. I will tell you exactly how I advertise. I'm not trying to hit one person more than anybody else or it is equal. It's simple. I go to any Facebook uh, and Craigslist. I do Craigslist as well, but I, it's very vague. It's looking to buy a mobile home. Who is selling? That's it. Keep keep it at that. Don't try to be so specific. I mean, unless that's exactly what you want, but I'm after any and everything. So from there, I get comments and direct messages, calls immediately. Well, do you buy one with land? Yes, we do. Do you buy one inside of the parks? I keep it open. I've noticed that when I try to make it more direct, it just like limits the crowd I've heard where, well, I didn't think you'd be interested because you're only buying a side of mobile home parks. And I thought, well, that just limited myself. How many other people I don't know about that in essence. But if you want to, you can say I'm looking for a mobile home on a private, private lot. Who's selling? Something as simple as that. I assure you, you post that enough on enough pages, somebody knows somebody knows somebody that will reach out to you. That word spreads. <clears throat> Was it somebody else on there? Okay. You see that? Chantel says, besides driving for dollars and building relationships with park managers slash owners, how can I connect with more park owners who buy, need mobile home inventory in their parks? LinkedIn. Make friends with it. If you're trying to connect with a park manager, you're almost going to have to visit or you're going to make a few phone calls. I have gotten many park owners, which, by the way, if you're dealing directly with the park owner, you are already in better hands anyway. That park manager is going to work with you very well um, because you're coming, obviously, referred by the owner. So they kind of get it from a different way. They don't see you as defensive. Let me explain the sense of that. Is So many of the parks that I've approached understand that a lot of the park managers live in these parks. They live, live in these parks. They're paid whatever. And when you're coming in, they see you as you trying to take their position. I've been told that. So in that sense, I guess you can understand why they may be a little defensive to letting any investor come in thinking that they're going to take over, over the park, over the job, et cetera. So, so definitely to be able to connect with a park owner, you're in better hands anyway. But I have found all the park owners that I deal with from LinkedIn. Um, and, and I post on LinkedIn like that. Any park owners looking for, in this case, pat, uh, empty pads, I was, I would put, I got a bunch of them, but, uh, any park owners with empty pads, uh, reach out to me. Again, I keep it very simple. It's nothing too, too crazy. Okay. All right. Let me jump onto another topic here real quick. Okay. So that was wholesaling. Um, you, you know, like I said, I, I do coach this or any questions after this, I'll be happy to give my number, my email. Y'all can further ask me on that, but all right. Uh, after wholesaling or other than wholesaling is say you do have your own money or your investors or whatever, but you're looking for something more like a fix and flip. So there's many ways to sell these uh, mobile homes once you do 
rehab them, right? I mean, you can fix and direct flip them, just make an X amount, you know, cash sale, whatever you want to do. Understand that most mobile homes do not have bank finance. Banks don't see it as a secure real estate. So especially the ones that are in a mobile home park, uh, I guess something brand new per se or something would in a sense. But some of these mobile homes that I work for instance, there's no lending. There's no, there's no uh, credit unions. There's no banks. It's basically uh, the buyer has to come in with cash. And that's where the idea to me was that I would play the bank, right? You're able to finance it to them and get a, I get a nice down payment when I do these things and then monthly payments every month until they pay me off. Right. But uh, again, one of the things you always need to remember, right. Keep, keep that in mind. Um, when you look at some of these homes, are you thinking short or long term? How long do you want to keep it? Um, if you're going to turn around and rent it, then you know that obviously that is the best investment that's going to keep your cash flow coming, but also you're playing landlord. Now, now you're a landlord, okay? Any issues with that rental, you know, they're going to call you. So keep, keep that in mind. And again, the numbers are what has to make sense at the end of the day. Your ROI, return on your investment, right? I like to get my money back as soon as possible. I don't like waiting on month. I invest, I want it back as quickly as possible. Let me walk you through one of my deals that I do because I, I don't do rentals anymore. I got out of that after the first year and it is all for sale or for sale with financing. So one of my deals, my number is 5,000. Um, if you heard in my videos, I like to be at 5,000 all exclusive. That's labor, that's material, that's holding, that's insurance, utilities, etc. All in for 5,000. That's what I like to be. I consider that a good number in my market. This same home in my market, I can usually turn around and sell it for 20000 And I like to ask anywhere from a two to 3000 down payment. So if you see those numbers, I have 5000 into it, which usually takes me a month, two months max to, to get this done. Um, if I get even a 2000 down payment, you know, that's already a third of my money, give or take, right? So within that first year, I should be able to get the rest of my money, and then I'm just collecting on it. The, re remember this key, the bigger the down payment, the more serious the buyer, usually the more responsible on top of that. It may not always be the case, but the lower the down payment, the less serious buyer you have, okay? So so that's basically what a deal of mine looks like. I, I like to stick to those, but um, in your sense, you have to remember is how long can you be out with, without that money? And again, wholesaling is always an option there. So even if you do lock up a great property, you decide to keep it, turn it into a rental, rent the own, finance it, whatever, you know, how long can you be without that money? Returning your investment. So just wanted to throw that out there is always keep that ROI in your mind. This is a very quiet group. This is a perfect opportunity for, for y'all to network, ask some questions, anything. All right, Chantel's got another question. Okay. I'm more buyers wanting to move homes across state lines. How do I connect with more movers who move homes out of state? I would put some ads out there. I would definitely search Google. Um, you know, you can reach out to local parks in those areas. And most times those park managers have done business with the transportation company or another. They can usually be a good source to tell you who is legit. Nothing against the transportation company, but they can usually park owners or park managers. I've noticed can usually tell you who you should use or suggest at least somebody. Have you, have you actually moved any out of state? I, I've, I've never moved in the United States. So. I moved, I, well, I wholesaled just one the other day, and it's actually going from uh, quite a distance, from Jefferson, Georgia, y'all know where it is, to Spartanburg. Okay. So I, I don't know. I don't know in a sense. I move a lot of homes, but not out, out of state, in state, whatever, no. I haven't really seen the criteria on that. All right. Any more questions? All right. Yeah, I guess let's get, get back rolling. Let's see. I put We Buy Mobile Homes. Somebody asked. I put We Buy Mobile Home ads up on Craigslist, and but haven't gotten any responses. All right. Well, I would say that on that, what I do when it comes to Craigslist is I have 
Craigslist, unlike Facebook, it does not list every county, every city. You can go to Facebook Market and put any city you want plus the state and buy. So like if I was looking at Atlanta, I would go search under Facebook Market and discover Atlanta, Georgia, buy, B-U-I, buy, just like that. And it's going to give me all the groups that have all the garage sales, the buy here, pay here, whatever, all this stuff. Those are the pages that I add. When it comes to uh, Craigslist, you don't have as many options. I mean, even in the state of Georgia, I think there's only like six or seven cities you can post. So obviously you find the nearest one to that city or county where you're trying to, trying to work. But I would say be consistent. You have to post every day. Every day, post the same ad, post different, change it up a little bit, don't get flagged by, by Craigslist either. But every day I post on Craigslist. see concerning transportation what's the range i can expect to pay in georgia per mile single wide most movers I, i've realized that uh, usually they start charging more after 50 miles that, that's usually what i'm getting is after my, and, and it's usually something crazy they may tell you it's uh 20 dollars per mile after, after that so you just got to find a good mover that moves them um get references like i say it depends on where you're at reach up the mobile home park uh, owners or managers, they can be a good source to that and direct you to somebody. At some point or another, they've moved them over home and they know who to go to and who to avoid. Um, but usually it's, you know, on a single, what I like to think in my area, it's usually around 3,000. Um, and Michael, you may know different on that, but that's usually what I'm seeing is 3,000 per single, wide, 50 miles or under. Yeah, yeah, I'm experiencing usually somewhere around 4,000, you know. Uh, yeah, somewhere around 4,000. Yeah, within 50 miles. It just mm -hmm. depends on where you go and location, you know, what they're setting it up on. But that's breaking it down, moving it, and setting it back up. But that, that just includes putting it on piers. That includes skirting or decking or utilities or anything like that. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, if you're talking double wide, yeah. it usually tends to be a little bit more than double. You have to understand yeah. that the transportation has to break it apart, transfer it in two single wide, technically reconnect it, and, you know, the job is just twice as hard. Uh, Natalie asks, I was driving. I have a question about comps. What do you use for to get comps to know what you can get for a wholesale deal or owner finance? Good question. Like I mentioned earlier, we don't have Zillow, truly a realtor, et cetera. So we have to do the legwork ourselves. Basically, get on any and every social media market that you find in that area and see what the homes are selling. Again, you can visit a mobile home park manager and ask for what are the homes selling in this area. What do you sell, a three-bedroom, two-bath, three-one, whatever? And they can tell you, and you basically just have to get your own information, put it together, and see what you're trying to buy. All right, Stacy's got a question for you. How do you make a deal make sense when the home needs to be moved? I've seen a lot of cheap mobile homes that need to be moved off the property. Either after repair value or what you can sell at home. Mine is the transportation. Mine is the home cost. What is left over for you? All right. I think that's all we got right now. If you... Somebody, somebody wrote something right there. Oh. I think. Did you see it? Yeah, I think so. Just pop up. I missed it again. Jose, are you only only wholesaling? No. No, I am. Uh, I own Mobile Home Parks, uh, Mobile Home Partners. I'm sorry, and uh, we're a one-stop shop. We buy them, we sell them, we finance them, we rehab them, we move them, etc. So tell them how many how many wholesale deals you've had approximately up to this point, and how many uh, properties you're uh, currently currently have. Uh, currently have a uh, rent the owns financing. I'm doing uh, I think right around sixteen now. Well, seventeen. I got one more. I'm supposed to be supposed to be finalizing, but right around sixteen right now. What I'm doing. Um, and wholesale deals this year. Fifty five, fifty six, maybe. And that's just, just this year, this calendar year? Yes. Wow. Yeah, it was it was my focus. Um, 
like I said prior to is, you know, anything I got, I wanted to keep, <laughs> obviously. But with my goal of having a mobile home park, I know the expenses that are heading my way. So uh, I got to build a uh, hip national, you know, the, the pocket money. So uh, I'm definitely focusing pretty strong on wholesaling. And that's been my mainly what, what I'm focusing on right now. Do you, Mike, as a manager, ever pay for someone else to relocate a home to your park? Um, all our lots are full. We, we're not bringing any homes in. Uh, we was we was going to move one home out and bring a new home in, but uh, when all this pandemic come out, we decided to uh, let let Stacy keep it here. She's Stacy's right on here right now, but she's she's rehabbing the home and it's looking pretty good so far. So uh, that's the only home that we was going to have an empty lot at. So. The only that, that's how I got into the parks is I they had one empty lot at one park and I moved to home in there and that's that's how I landed the job that I'm doing now with the relationship. That is a, a a good thing though there, Michael. Um, you know, do keep in mind that if you are trying to bring if if you're working with a park owner or park managers, a lot of the time these park owners and our managers will pay in full to bring your unit into their park. So the transportation costs, they'll eat it for you. And that can, in a sense, make a good deal. Yes, and, and he's right. You know, call around. You know, that one of the homes I moved in, you know, they they pulled, they paid for the whole move and setup. But, you know, um, that's few and far between because I've called many parks and nobody else would offer that. They might give you a couple months lot rent free or, you know, six months up to a year. But uh, mm -hmm. offering, uh, you know, move and set up for you. I mean, that just made it a no brainer right there. So definitely uh, call around and it's good to know that up front. So before you get a home that needs to be moved. Deals are out there. Definitely. Don't be scared to ask. Well, first thing you can get is a no, right? So let's see. I think there's one more question in the chat. Uh, how long have I, I've been uh, four and a half years in, in mobile home investing. Any other questions coming in, Michael? You see, uh, I'm able to control a little bit more here than I thought on my end, but okay. Yeah, yeah, just go back into rent down a little bit more. So what else you got there? What kind of spread you look for? And uh... Okay, so when you're thinking about rentals and even really financing inside of a mobile home park, keep in mind, obviously, the, the lot rent, you know, again, the numbers have to make sense here, but I like to make more than the park is making on me. Right. And by that, let me make an example. Some of the homes I have here nearby, I'm collecting anywhere from 700 to 750. Right. The same part collects about 350 from me. To me, that's a decent spread. But again, in the example I used earlier in Columbus, um, you know, I was paying the part 400. And I was collecting about 550. So that, in a sense, is not a good deal. And those were rentals. Understand, obviously, if, you know, any little hiccups, any, anything that needs to be fixed, if you're only collecting 100 or 150 a month from this, and you're having to pay 100 150 for whatever issue may be, you make nothing on this property. You know, the, the, mark is, the park is making a killing at this point, and you're just basically just freaking even, not losing anything. So keep keep that in mind. Um, and again, that's what I'm talking about exit strategies. You can't use the same exit strategy in every county, every city, every state is different. So just know your market, know your comps, know your rental rental rates. And based on that, you can determine, same as with, with real estate, you can't just sell, buy here and et cetera. You know, you have to know the numbers and whatever makes sense, that's what you can do there. Doesn't mean you can't do business. For something like that, wholesale all day long. Wholesale those homes, maybe you can probably flip them but again you know keep in mind if you had to, if you're stuck with that property what are you looking at so how many how many homes do you uh sell for cash you know compared to uh you know owner finance not many. I, I've noticed that again there's no banks for a mobile home. So if you're trying to sell too high of a number, whatever that may be, like a 20,000. Nobody's bringing me 20,000. I've heard people have done that before, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's not, that's not common. So I've noticed that if I'm, if I'm going to sell it for cash and again, I have 5,000 into the home, if I just absolutely want it gone, I do see 10,000 many times. And therefore I can sell it for that. You know, I have a $5,000 profit I can make off of that. 
and, and that's okay. But anything more than that, you know, most people will immediately ask you for financing. What can you do in the sense of financing? And I just, again, it's, you know, it's an asset. It's a cash flow in a sense, and I keep it. So I, I do offer that. Yeah, got a question here for you. What is the first thing you would do if you were looking to make a your first deal right now in this economy? What would I be looking? What would, what would be your first steps for you to take, you know, right now in this economy to, to make your first deal happen? I would make sure that the numbers make sense. Again, the numbers have to make sense. As long as those numbers work, I mean, you can do many things with these homes. Yeah, you know, I, I, what I see a lot of people asking for questions about well, what's your thoughts on this, you know, you know, you got a lot of these people that uh, got these, these higher end homes, you know, that they're asking, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, you know, um, you know, how, how would you approach that owner? Or would you even not waste your time? I mean, what, how do you look at a deal when you see, you know, a deal going for, you know, thirty, forty thousand $40,000 in a park that, whether it, you know, be, you know, 2000s model or, or whatever, a double wide, you know, what's your thoughts on that? I would stay away from them myself. I mean, you know, that's not a deal to me. I don't know what market that may be in, but it doesn't sound like one. Um, the less money in it, the better, obviously. But, I mean, you know, you, you have to educate yourself to know what you're looking at. But, again, you know, always keep in mind, what can I sell this home for? Okay, if I come in and I fix it and I put, you know, obviously an estimated amount of money on labor, material, cost, et cetera, what can I turn around and sell this home for? All right, based on that number you have, minus what, plus what you paid, you know, what leaves it for me at that point? What is the spread? That, that's how I like to look at it. Right, what about wholesaling though? You wouldn't even bother wholesaling something like that? You could try, but I mean, you know, when you start getting higher numbers like that, you know, your, your, your buyers, you're definitely limited. I don't have many buyers that are buying like that. But, you know, everybody's different. You, if right. you do, by all means, get it, lock it, and make you whatever you can make it off of it. But those numbers there scare me personally. Okay. I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I try to stay away from stuff like that for the most part. Here we got another mm -hmm. question for you. In building relationships with a park manager, do you offer any cash for incentive finder's fees or anything? To the park itself, no, not really. Um, usually with them, you know, I make it, any park managers always make it about them. You, you know, many of these investors that I ask them, you know, well, what did you tell the park manager? Well, I want to buy this unit here and I want to rent it and I want to wholesale it. None of that was about the park manager. None of that benefited them. Make them realize why they need you when you come in. All right. I realize that you have this broken lot over here, 24. Surely it's not making any money. It's just sitting there. I like to have the chance to be able to come in here and purchase this home, rehab it, and start making new lot rent. Now you're talking beauty to them. That's what they're in business for. They're renting the lot, and as long as they're not making any money, they're not property. So if you can come in and secure that, on top of that, I usually tell them, you know, as long as I'm in here doing business, whether it's renting it or financing to them for that two, three years, your lot is guaranteed on the first of the month. Again, everything is about them. Make them realize that they need you. When you leave there, they're thinking about you and what other deal they can get. Yeah, I mean, he's right. You know, if, if, if you get in the right parks, you know, some of these people, they don't want investors in there. But uh, if you can make them understand why they can need you. But there's, there is tons of investors out there that, that want essentially Lonnie dealers in their park because they just want to, they just want to rent the dirt. They don't, they don't want to own the homes. So got to make sure you find those parks or try to convince them why you want to be there. Uh, got another question for you here. Any recommendations on vendors for rehab materials? Any recommendations on what now? Uh, materials for rehabbing. You know, what kind of vendors you use for your materials? Okay. So I like to use now, I personally have a commercial license with Lowe's and Home Depot. So I'm able to get contractor, you know, uh, prices on a lot of my material, but uh, and that's a good question actually. Keep in mind that a lot of the material that you use on a home on a real estate does not fit a mobile home. Doors, tubs, etc. That, that's one thing that I had I had to figure out my, myself. But I use Facebook Market a lot. 
definitely to get deals, you know, use whatever you, you need to do off Craigslist. You can find material there as well. Uh, on, on that note, you know, where, what are you doing to, you know, find your contractors and your different uh, markets you go into? Contractors, if you have not already worked with them, you will realize that uh, you're going to have headaches. <laughs> Michael knows. Uh, you know, I don't talk bad about anybody. Yeah, so, you know, they're definitely difficult. I mean, I have, I've had some handymen that do phenomenal, phenomenal work. But one of the hardest things, and I think most even real estate people say, is one of the hardest things when we have homes is dealing with their contractors. You get the typical, I'm sick, my car's broke, I, I can't make it, et cetera. And if you're on a timeline and you're paying holding costs, that's not going to work. So, you know, I can't say one way or the other, but I can say that for my end is I like to interview these people. I like to see how serious they are. I like to keep them. And I do pay them incentives and those bonuses. You know, if you give me a set date, but you complete it sooner than that, you know, job done right accordingly, et cetera, you know, I will pay you an extra $150, $200 for, you know, for bonus for getting this job sooner. But I'll, I'll post on Facebook Market on that as well. Facebook Market is definitely my go-to. I think we got another questions coming up. Let's see. Um, average per hour rate for handyman. No such thing. Don't ever pay that. A handyman can take 30 minutes or an hour to put one nail in, into the floor. That's not going to work. I paid my handyman and contractors by the job, the job. And I break that to them very quickly and let them know. All right. So if I was interviewing a handyman, I'll let them know, okay, you're not going to make the top dollar with me. These are mobile homes. I need them basically professionally done, presentable, and able for somebody to be moving ready. Uh, I can't offer you top dollar, but what I can offer you is continued work. They like to hear that. They, they like to know some security of continued work coming in. And they usually respect that. But I let them know that I pay you by the job. That means that you're going to give me a list breakdown of what this home needs, whatever it is that you're doing. And let's just say it needs roof replacing or fixing. It needs flooring work. It needs walls. Okay, when you complete that roof, you call me. We're going to inspect it. And if it checks out, you get a check right there. Then you jump onto the floor, for instance. When you're done with that, you call me. We inspect it, and you get a check. You can get paid every day, technically, if you complete these jobs. But it's never by the hours, never a salary. It's always me. It's always by the job. Now, how do you handle that with your handyman? Do you give them uh, money up front to pay for materials? You pay them for materials, and what kind of percentage you give them, you know, to get started? I don't give them anything until they complete the first uh, the first job. When it comes to materials, is like I mentioned, is I have a contractor license with uh, Lowe's and Home Depot, so they actually pick up whatever they need, and they go check out at customer service. Customer service calls me to do a phone sale. And as soon as that's completed, I get a receipt directly to my email with every piece of, piece of material they purchase. I'm able to help them accountable. Too. Now, are you uh, negotiating with a handyman? You already got a set price, you know, when you call them out there, you know, since you've been doing this for so long, you know what you want to pay. You kind of give them an idea what you want to pay or, or do you let them throw their number out there first? How you, how you handle that? I like the feel, especially, you know, and one thing back to the, you know, finding good handyman is if you find a good handyman, good contractor that you work with, stick with them. Keep them forever if you can. But, uh, yes, when it's a new handyman or contractor, you know, I'll let them give me the numbers. I want to feel what, what they're sensing there. And some will try to bump up the prices just a tad bit on you. So definitely watch out for that. But, Yes, I, I, you know, I have a negotiation. It's basically what I like to pay. I personally started doing this myself in rehab well over 10 units by myself. So I know what it takes, what to look for, et cetera. So, yes, I have a set price as to what, what I like to pay. All right, that's all we got right now. I saw a question on here earlier. Uh, I bring the park manager's donuts and Easter baskets. Works for me. Yes, I brought my park manager's uh, lunch many times, including next Tuesday. I'll be going to see one, and I'll be bringing her lunch. So, yes, professionally done. That does help. <laughs> Let's 
Let me know if any other questions. Uh, I'm trying to think of another topic we can discuss here within this uh, wholesale exit strategies. Yeah, that's what I was trying to think of some questions, but uh, I was uh, hoping some of these attendees asked some. I, I can't think of nothing right offhand. <laughs> One thing I'm going to suggest, because I see this a lot, and, you know, when I first started four and a half years ago, nobody knew mobile homes. They, they were out there, but investors were very low-key. You had to dig them up to find them. Nowadays, you can go to Facebook, and there's a wholesaler in every corner. There's somebody selling a mobile home, somebody flipping, somebody rehabbing, et cetera. So the niche definitely has grown. But And, and in the sense of that, you know, I don't see another investor as competition. I see them as somebody I can – I can network with him or her because if it's a deal I don't I can't do anything with you know I can reach out to you and vice versa but in sense there is competition it's definitely grown so obviously deals are going by quicker but one thing that I suggest is never try to make a deal a deal it's either a deal or it's not a deal and just because it seems cheap it doesn't mean it's a deal maybe it was cheap for a reason so don't rush into your sales. Know your numbers. I will keep saying that. Know your numbers. Know what you're purchasing. Know how to do your due diligence. If it's your first time you're just now getting started and you've got going out there to view a property, you don't know what you're looking at, bring you a handyman. Hire him for an hour or half an hour. Contractor. He or she will point out exactly what you may not be able to see. So that's one thing is, you know, never try to make a deal with a deal and don't ever rush trying to purchase something. Now, if you're wholesaling, then you want to lock it up and maybe be able to negotiate further with the with the seller. You know, one thing I put is uh, based upon final inspections, what I put on my wholesale sheets, based, meaning that I'm going to go out there, I'm going to check it out thoroughly, and if it checks out, we will go with the number that we agree. If it does not, I'm either not a buyer or we got to negotiate a little bit more. All right. You spoke about exit strategy. How long do you hold a home if it takes longer to find a buyer? What are some of our other exit strategies to exercise? So usually usually you can always find a tenant. But one thing that I like to do when I'm about to have a property or I immediately get a property is I like to go ahead and start advertising it. Now, obviously, if you're working in the same city and county and you keep doing work there, you're going to notice that if you had one rental, you probably had 50 tenants available that would have taken your home. All right, what did you do with those numbers and those names of those tenants? That was your buyer's list. So keep it so that as soon as you have another deal, you technically already have a buyer or a tenant aligned. Uh, question I got from uh, that I seen posted the other day, what are you doing to screen out your tenants? Very thoroughly. <laughs> now, most park managers like to do their own because anybody who lives in a park, if you're working in a park, um, you know, they're going to do their own background. But I personally like to do my own. I use rentprep.com. That's just my, you know, that's what I like. Nothing special. I'm not selling them. And I like to check everything possible. I like to call the references. I like to call their previous landlord where they live. And screen them. That that is another thing. You don't rush. Don't just get somebody in your house because they're ready to live in it and give you a down payment or a deposit. Because understand that getting rid of tenants or buyers out of your mobile home takes a long time. And if you're paying a lot, that can eat your pocket up real quick. So you want to make sure you do a thorough background on anybody and everybody. Yeah, especially with the way things are going on right now, you might not be able to get them out for a while. So. <laughs> Definitely go back, you know, a couple of landlords if you, you know, at least you should. And I don't know, you know, uh, Cozy does it, and uh, I'm sure Rent Ready, the, the guy that's hosting this for us, Ed, uh, I'm pretty sure his software, you can, you can do a, you know, they do background checks also, I'm pretty sure. So, hey, Mike, what? Just to give you, we, we do um, ours again, you can set it to automatic. So every application comes with a, full TransUnion credit criminal and eviction tenant pays $35 or you can set it to manual. So you review the application first, but we also use it to your point about finding the best tenants. We worked with this uh, course of management in New Jersey three and a half years ago in development. They managed 2,900 units. We took their pre-qualification. So basically tenants just answer 10 questions ahead of time before they even 
do an application or showing or anything, which is uh, how many occupants, how many pets, what are they, any smokers, anyone party to a lawsuit, anyone convicted of a felony, if so what, credit score range, your income, your guarantor's income, and do you have federal assistance like a section eight, et cetera. Then you just one click, accept, reject, or request an update. And that narrows down to your point from like 50 down to five really quick. Mm -hmm. And then, they, right. then you can move them onto the application and we do the full screening and all that kind of stuff. So just to, yeah, our, our, our way of put a lot of emphasis on like the idea of find the right tenant right from the start, because that's the most expensive part of the, you know, you know, more than the renovation sometimes is, <laughs> is having a bad tenant, you know? You charge, you charge that directly to the uh, tenant when they apply? What's that? Yeah, the tenant pays $35 for the screening. It's basically, you know, my smart move. If you went on their website, it's their $38 package. We give it to the tenant for 35. Okay. So, so the tenant's paying for it. And the, the, your service fee of, uh, whether it's monthly or yearly, that's- Our like service fee is just uh, unlimited units, flat price. So if you're paying uh -huh. monthly, it's nineteen ninety five. If it's annual, it's $9 a month or $108 for the whole year. Okay. So, yeah. Or flat fee for landlords. Sure. Pretty good. I like that. Okay. Go. Cool. Appreciate it. You bet. Thanks. I'll give it back to you. All right. I think we had a couple questions here. Uh, let's see here. Felony restrictions, credit score. Uh, what you looking for? You know, as far as uh, felonies, you know, pretty much most parks aren't going to accept any felonies. Uh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Unless it's a misdemeanor, it's a long, long, long time ago or something. So I try to stay away from any felony charges, period. Uh, what kind of credit score do you look for? And what do you think of felonies? What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I would agree. And it really isn't going to be your choice anyway. If you're working inside of a mobile home park, the park, park has its own rules and regulations, and they're going to tell you immediately no felonies. So whether you want to give that person a chance or not, they're not going to allow it. So credit score. I don't as much focus on credit score as I do making sure that they have a steady job, steady income, and they can prove that. Yeah, yeah, that and just to make sure that, you know, uh, not as much a score as it is to see what, what they uh, didn't pay, you know. Have they had any evictions, you know? Uh, they, You know, who, who did they not pay? Was it just like a hospital bill or was it, you know, they let their car and everything mm -hmm. come back, you know? That's mm -hmm. that's important than the score sometimes. Uh, so given COVID, I'm getting a lot of buyers asking about financing. What are some financing lenders you recommend? Some financing what? Uh, she's asking what, what kind of lenders that offer financing that, that you recommend. I don't know if you really work with any uh, lenders. So if, if, if you don't know to finance something, you probably, you probably don't mess with that too much or what? I mean, I, I got a list of people I can, I can give you on that, Chantel. I, I don't know if you got any or not, Jose. I do not. No, I don't. All right. Yeah, I, I can share some of those with you, Chantel. Uh, uh, Credit Human. Uh, I, I think we got about nine on our website. So uh, remind me if I forget, and I'll try to share that information with you. Let me see. Mm -hmm. I think we have something else over here. Let's see. What was the software Jay said and when owner financing, what, what, what software was that? Uh, Natalie, we talk about for rent. If it was for back screen checking, I use rentprep.com, rentprep.com. And when, when owner financing, do you get your tenants to pay lot rent separately or do you pay it and collect one set payment? I only have one tenant doing that way. I would not suggest that. I would suggest you take one lump sum from the tenant or the buyer in this case, and you take care of that lot rent. You pay that, that lot rent whether that buyer pays you or not, because it's going to secure your home. One thing that you can run into if you do that separate, you allow them to go pay. What if they don't? A lot of park managers don't even call you, text you, or let you know that you're behind until you're very behind. And then they're basically calling eviction on you. So I would say, no, you handle that transaction by yourself. All right. I may have missed something early on. Did you say all in 5,000 purchase in rehab? That's from Jan. 
me, my numbers, that's where I like to be with my home. Single wides, all exclusive, 5,000. That's my numbers. All right. All right. Let's see. Even three, two. And we got a few questions that, coming on. But yeah, I think I think that's where you like to be, no matter what, huh? Yeah, and uh, even a three, two. Yeah, but that's a specific. Okay, what I like is three twos. Three ones are okay. Two twos, maybe sometimes those are definitely have my numbers lower. But three twos, those are those are king. <laughs> All right, well, we got a few more minutes for some questions. Uh, Y'all got any questions? Jose, if you want to spend a few more minutes and kind of explain a little bit about coaching, if anybody's interested, you know, we all know the information's out there, but if you're looking for somebody, you know, local here in the area, it's been doing it for a long time, you know, Jose has a coaching program. He just started up. So if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, and I'm actually about to restart it now, but it's a seven week program. Um, it's a Zoom call, similar to what we're doing right now, and um, gives a chance to multiple people be on their network question. Understand that many times there's there's a such thing as a question that you don't know exists until you hear it being asked. So that can help you that way. But it's a seven-week program. Uh, Sunday, I think it's 8 p.m. It's uh, 30, 30, 45 minutes long, and we just we go over different topics every every week. I give the students homework. And basically, by that seventh uh, week when you're done, there's no reason why you don't have all the information to do your first or next deal. Uh, aside from that, I also offer, if you're more interested in one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching, same thing, seven, um, seven different uh, classes. We can do those one week if you like. I would suggest it. You need time to study and learn what, what you're being taught. But uh, those are more direct. It's a one-on-one -on -one call at that point. You have a little more access to me, and it's way more coach at that point. As far as one-on-one, -on -one, you don't actually get out in the field and, you know, walk homes and, you know, kind of give an inspection process or anything like that? Or If they're in my area, I'd be happy to absolutely meet them. And, yeah, I can uh, – usually the students have done that. I'm walking through, through a whole deal. So, you know, that definitely, you know, high department management, if you're there and if I'm nearby, why not? Let's call them together. Uh, you also, uh, you know, share all your, your forms, contracts, and stuff like that? So you have to be a little bit careful when it comes to that. Certain forms that uh, are simple, yes, but understand that anytime you give somebody else a form of any kind of use, you are playing attorney. You're saying this is qualified and you may use it. So you want to be careful as to what you can give or cannot. But something like a wholesale sheet, a bill of sale, sure, absolutely. Okay. Anybody else got any more questions before we uh, head on out? I think I saw a couple. Let me see if I can pull them up. Uh, what years do you, do you invest in? Um, any. I don't, I don't really discriminate any. I like to stay 90s and above, but uh, my last full sales and investments were mid-70s and 80s, so it just depends. Again, if the numbers make sense, that's what you're after. Uh, what is the website for coaching? Um, you can uh, visit me. Mobilehomepartner.com is my site. Mobile Home partner and on there it actually gives you links to my all my social media facebook twitter instagram youtube got a lot of videos on the recording as well but uh yeah reach me on there and just send me an email Be happy to assist now on your on your coaching you do um, you know take phone calls you know whenever you know your, your students reach out to you and ask you stuff or how, how do you handle that yeah most of my students i give them a uh, my email that's how i like to respond i respond pretty promptly on that but unless they're working on a deal is one-on-one -on -one, then those call you know that's a little more time management so i like them to call me at that point yes and you know anybody has got you know great deals i mean jose always looking so we don't, we don't mind partnering up with somebody or you know i guess wholesale deals you know but it's got to be a good wholesale deal not not a retail deal <laughs> there you go we don't buy retail you buy wholesale no matter what so uh, if anybody wants to partner up, I'm, I'm happy to hear you out. I'm sure Jose is. Uh, you know, y'all y'all can reach out to me. I'm I'm not big in social media, but you know, people reach out to me. I, I try to get back. Might not be super prompt, but you know, I got stuff going on. You know, I, I try to answer your questions. Uh, y'all feel free free to reach me out anytime. And the same goes for Jose. If y'all don't see his name out there, uh, you ain't on Facebook very often. <laughs> <laughs> 
for sure. Okay. I think that's it. That's all we got, Ed. I appreciate everybody. Thanks for coming on out. Thanks, Jose. For yeah, you. Thank you. Have a great night. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, guys.